Welcome back to General Calculus. This is the recitation video that goes with our video on four ways to represent a function. In our first example, we will be revisiting the road trip we took in our intro video. Suppose Tatsu and I are driving out to Boulder, Colorado from Kansas City, Missouri, and we want to describe the relationship between time and distance traveled. A common way to do this would be to simply say, the car's speed is 70 miles per hour. Though perhaps another way to express this that makes the mathematical relationship between distance and time more clear would be to say, every hour, the car travels 70 miles. This would be a verbal representation of our function. We can also use this statement to fill out a table showing the function, thus giving us a numerical representation. If we have traveled for zero hours, then we haven't been able to go anywhere yet. So we have traveled zero miles. So we put zero and zero on the table. After one hour, we have traveled 70 miles. So we put a one in the ne next hour slot and a 70 in the corresponding distance slot. After two hours, we have traveled yet another 70 miles. So 70 plus 70 gives us 140 in the distance category. And likewise, after three hours, we have traveled 210 miles. We repeat this process for whatever length of time we would like to include on our table. This filled out table gives us a numerical representation of the function. We can use the data from this table to create ordered pairs, x, y, to graph the relationship and give us a visual representation of the function. In ordered pairs, the first coordinate represents our input, x, or in this case, the amount of time we have been traveling. And the second coordinate, y, represents the output, which is distance. When plotting these on a graph, the horizontal axis represents x values, or time, and the vertical axis represents y values, or distance traveled in an amount of time. We begin by plotting our first point, 0, 0, at the origin. That one is fairly straightforward. To plot our next point, 170, we move one unit horizontally to represent traveling for one hour, and 70 units vertically to represent traveling 70 miles. We then plot our point 170 right here. We repeat this idea to plot 2, 140, 3, 210, and the other points on our table. Finally, we connect the points to display the graph of our function. Finally, we have our last representation of this function, algebraic. This means we have a mathematical formula to describe the relationship every hour we travel 70 miles. This relationship is described by f of x equals 70 times x. In case you are not familiar with this notation, the f represents the function itself. x is our input, and 70x is the output. So to determine how far we've gone in a certain amount of time, we plug that number x into the function, and we get the output. For example, to see how far we've traveled after one hour, we replace the x with a 1 and simplify the right side. This gives us 70, which makes sense because we've said that after one hour, we've traveled 70 miles. We can do this for two hours as well, plugging in 2 for x and simplifying the right side, we get 140, which also agrees with the numbers we've been getting all along. Note that we want the results from each of these representations to agree, as they are all expressing the same relationship, just in a different way. All right, moving on to our second example, we are going to talk about payments on a phone. Just like Liz here, you might be excited to get a brand new smartphone, but you know that it can get pretty expensive. So exactly how much are you gonna have to pay after a certain number of months? Well, let's take a look. For a real life example like this one, describing the function verbally is the most logical first step. So like I said, this function is going to relate the time to the total payment amount you make towards your phone. Oftentimes, phone companies will say something like, pay just $120 today and $40 a month afterward. Another way to say that would be that there is a base payment of $120 plus a monthly payment of $40. Okay, so now that we know how to describe this function verbally, 
Let's see how this statement helps us represent the function numerically. So here, we're going to fill a table where we keep track of time in months in the first row and the total payment in dollars in the second row. As we can see in the verbal description here, there is, once again, a base payment of $120 plus a monthly payment of $40. So after zero months, we only have the base payment, which is $120. Then after one month, the first $40 monthly payment kicks in, so we pay an additional $40, and the total payment comes out to $120 plus $40, or $160. And after two months, we now have another $40 monthly payment, so we tack that on to get $200. And similarly, after three months, we have another $40 monthly payment to get $240. We can follow this pattern and fill out the table for however many months the contract with your phone company lasts, which usually feels approximately forever, as we all know. Now, we can move on to representing this function visually on a graph. Corresponding to the rows of the table we just made, we have time in months on the horizontal x-axis and the total payment amount in dollars on the vertical y-axis. As before, we want to start by plotting the base payment of $120 after zero months. That would correspond to the point here, 0, 120. And now from this point, we know that we have a monthly payment of $40. So we move one month to the right and move $40 up, giving us our next point, 1, 160 meaning that we've paid $160 after one month. We repeat this process to get the next point, 2, 200, meaning $200 in two months, 3, 240, or $240 in three months, etc., until approximately eternity, as we all know. And once you've got the points laid out, you can connect the dots to get your function. Finally, the algebraic representation of this function is this. f of x is equal to 40x plus 120. Now, this representation is nice because the monthly payments and the base payment show up as separate pieces. The 40x represents the $40 you'll be paying every month, and the 120 represents the $120 base payment. But Still, the idea of this representation is the same as our previous example. When we feed x into our function f, well, we get the result 40x plus 120 back as our output. So as a final exercise for this example, let's just check that this algebraic representation works. First, substituting x is equal to 1, we get 40 times 1 plus 120, or 160. So this means that after one month, we've paid a total of $160, which agrees with our previous representations. Next, substituting x is equal to 2, we get 40 times 2 plus 120, or 200. And once again, the result that we've paid $200 after two months agrees with our previous representations of this same function. For our next example, we show how to go from an algebraic representation of a function to a numeric representation. This time, we are starting with the formula f of x equals x squared minus 2x plus 5. This is our algebraic representation. To get the numeric representation, we will fill out a table by plugging in different values for x and recording those and their outputs in the table shown. Sometimes it can be difficult to decide what values to use for this. Our recommendation is to start with zero and go up from there. So we begin by replacing all the x's in this formula with zeros. Simplifying the right side, we see that the value of this function for x equal to zero is five. We record this in our table and repeat this idea for our next value, which will be x equal to one. Plugging in one for x and simplifying, we say that f of one is equal to four and add this to our table. Same thing for x equal to 2. Plugging in 2, 
we get f of 2 is equal to 5 and add this to our table. Next, we try x equal to 3. After simplifying, we see that f of 3 is 8. We can fill in as many values as we want on this table, applying the same idea with replacing x's with our desired input value and simplifying the right side to get our output and then recording it on our table. Here, we do this for x equal to 4, which gives us an output of 13, x equal to 5, which gives us 20, and x equal to 6, which gives us 29. And then we add all these values to our table. All right. Our fourth and final example is going to look at how we can start from a numerical representation of a function, or in other words, a table, and get a visual representation, or in other words, plot a graph of the function. So first of all, here is an example of a numerical representation of a function. And now let's see how this table can help us plot this graph. The idea is to always keep your ordered pairs in mind. Just like in our previous examples, the first row of the table, x, is going to be plotted on the horizontal axis, and the second row of the table, y, is going to be plotted on the vertical axis. So the first point here corresponds to the ordered pair 0, 200. So starting from the origin, we move 0 units to the right and 200 units up, getting us the point there. The second point is the ordered pair 1, 190. So once again, starting at the origin, we move one unit to the right and 190 units up, getting us the second point right here. We can do the same thing for the ordered pair 2, 125. So going two units to the right and 125 units up gets us this third point. Repeating this process for all the points on the table, we get a series of dots like so. And connecting these dots gets us this beautiful curve, a visual representation of the function.